Thank you very much. Uh, tonight is a kind of a two-part program. I'm going to talk to you about the mural, and then we'll, we will hear from our trailblazers in the recent past. Now, a lot of you may have known Judy Nies, um, and I understand some members of her family are here tonight. Judy was an activist in a number of areas, especially those relating to women and girls. One of the first uh, things I remember her being involved in was a program called Choose Your Shoes, where she was, I know, uh, prepared a program for teenage girls to help them find their options to occupations outside of the normal run-of-the-mill uh, things of the day. She was also very active in getting a plaque uh, for Rhoda Lavinia Goodell at the courthouse and at that time created the Rock County Women's History Committee, members of which are here tonight. Well, Judy died in uh, May of 2009, and it was a tragedy for all of us. And friends of Judy Nees got together and wanted to find a way to honor her memory. Well, one of the things that happened was two of her friends, Chris Keffler and Carl Swanson, looked at the murals that were being put up in the downtown area on Janesville's history and basically said, where are the women? And the Friends of Judy Nees decided that she would be in the forefront of creating a mural identifying and honoring the women in Janesville's past. So we got together and we worked with the Janesville Design and Development Center, which prepared the first three murals. One of the first things we looked at is the time frame. The first murals were 10-year time periods, 1830 to 1840, 1840, 1850, 1850, 1860. Well, we rapidly realized that if you did that, there was going to be too many murals for places in the town to put them. So we decided on a 30-year time period, 1860 to 1890. And um, this is the result of it. There was a committee a design and content committee. Oh, Chris Moore is here, who is a shining light on this whole process. And uh, Carl Swanson helped us prepare a grant for the Humanities Council to uh, hire a consultant who is a historian to help us make sure that the content was appropriate and that we weren't uh, outside the time frame or outside of Janesville, I, I should say. So we have a mural, and very fittingly, the central figure is a suffragist. And in our research, one of the things we found out that well-known suffragists like Susan B. Anthony actually came to spoke in Janesville in the 1860s. The next two uh, figures on the mural are Rhoda Lavinia Goodell and Angie King. Rhoda Goodell has the honor of being the first woman attorney in the state of Wisconsin. And she has a secondary uh, honor and is very important statewide in that when she had a case that went before the state Supreme Court, she was told that she could not argue before that, that court because she was a woman. Well, not one to take no for an answer, she went to the state legislature and got them to change the law very specifically allowing women to argue cases before the state Supreme Court. Angie King was the third lawyer in the state of Wisconsin, and she and Rhoda Goodell actually uh, worked together in a number of cases. But Angie also has an interesting history in that she was elected to be postmaster for Janesville, and when that, rec that election or recommendation went to Washington, the congressman who actually had the, appointment, the power to make the recommendation for the appointment said, no way, I want a man in that position. Well, Angie King decided to study law then and became our third attorney. The next figure is Nellie Tallman. Nellie is important to us because of her work in the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s with Associated Charities. One of the first uh, 
outgrowths of looking after the people who cannot afford to help themselves. Associated Charities worked hard to get a hospital. and We also represent the first hospital, which is still existing on uh, Sutherland Avenue. Women were also very involved in the public library movement. Now, there was a library that the men's club created, but you had to pay a fee to belong to it. And they decided, well, they didn't want to be in that business anymore, and they put their books up for sale. The Ladies Afternoon Club raised the money to buy the books. They found a location and created the first free public library in Janesville. A few years later, they convinced the city council to take it over. The building pictured here is the old cotton mills building. The cotton mills is important because women who were in the workforce at the time um, the cotton mills was in full operation, women were two-thirds of the employees there. And we also show them with some of their tools of their trade at the time. So that's the mural. Well, how did we get to the mural? Besides the first uh, humanities grant, we had a committee that talked about the content, but they also worked on uh, selecting the artists. And if members of that committee would raise their hands, I'd like to honor you because it was a lot of work. We had an open call for artists. It was a two-step process. We had, I think it was 28 artists from around the state who submitted examples of their work. Four artists were selected to come up with a uh, proposed mural, and the final one was selected. The um, educational component and the uh, brochure that you'll find on the table today was funded by a Wisconsin Humanities Council grant, and it paid for hiring a consultant to do more further research and uh, for the printing of the brochure. And I want to acknowledge Carl Swanson and Jean Yeomans for all their work that they did on the, the mural and the grant. So please take a copy of this home. It not only includes information about the mural, but also about other women in the community who were important in Janesville's history. Ones you already know about, such as uh, Carrie Jacobs Bond, Francis Willard, but also ones you might not remember, uh, such as Helen Lindsay Sutherland, who was involved in building of uh, the 1920 high school, which was important when uh, GM was enticed to come into town. So you have the mural, you have the brochure, and now we have three speakers who are going to talk about more recent trailblazing. And our first speaker is Nancy Stapp. Nancy is an example of women in politics. She ran for and served on the city council from 1979 to 1982. She was the eighth, I'm sorry, not the eighth, she was the fifth woman to actually serve on Janesville City Council. But before we ask Nancy to say a few words, I want to tell you about the first woman, Mrs. Emma Manning. In 1921, this is before women had the right, or just after women got the right to vote. She was reported by the Gazette as one of the ten Janesville women chosen on a Rock County Circuit Court jury list for the first time in history. I think we got away from having women on juries for quite a while. In 1923, Janesville changed from a mayor alderman form of government to the city manager council form that we have today. Seven council members were elected, and Emma Manning was one of those. So she was elected to the first city council we had under our current system of local government. In September of that year, the Gazette reported that according to UW Press, she holds the distinctive position in the state of being 
Wisconsin's only councilwoman. Uh, women were council tre or city treasurers in Broadhead, Elkhorn. Whitewater has an alter woman, a different form of local government. Women were village treasurers in Albany, Clinton, Palmyra, and Sharon. And other Wisconsin cities had women in nearly every municipal office. So starting in 1923, we've had, uh, now we have 12 women who have served on the city council. They were Emma Manning, Addie Fitzgerald, Mrs. Frances Henke, Sima Wexler, Nancy Stab, Mary Schmidt, Marion Knoll, Sharon Heitzman, Victoria Damron, Amy Lushing, Kathy Boskell, and now Deb Dungara Adams. And we're going to ask Nancy to come in and talk about her experiences on the city council. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Is it on? Mm -hmm. Good. Um, I, when they asked me to do this, I really don't feel like a trailblazer, but um, especially compared to the other women on this panel. But um, I guess being the fifth person, just woman, to serve on the city council is something of a distinction. Um, so how did I get there, and uh, why did I think I could do that? And I was thinking about that, and. Um, well, I think one of the things that helped me was that I, in college, I had a non-traditional major. I am a chemistry, I'm a chemist, and so I, you know, I was in classes with lots of guys, and so I wasn't intimidated by them. But the other thing was that uh, right after I moved to town in 1966, I got involved in the Janesville League of Women Voters, and um, because of my interest in government, I would go to council meetings, and um, I got asked to serve on a couple of advisory committees, a signed advisory committee, and the, and the first community development authority. And I would go to the meetings, and I would see these men up there, and I thought, they're not even prepared for these meetings, many of them. And I can do that. <laughs> I can do better than that. <laughs> so I, I, I sort of felt like, you know, I, I could do it. But I didn't have the, the, the confidence to just actually step forward and do it. It was that I was recruited to run that made the difference for me. And I think, I always say that when people ask me about this, because we want more women in government, we have to recruit them. Because I think women, unlike men, typically do not step forward and say, oh, I'm gonna give back to the community, I'm gonna serve on the city council. I've never been on a committee before, but that's what I'm gonna do now. Um, so just remember that. So I was recruited to run in 1979, and the issues that I cared about uh, then were land use and planning, so the city council was the natural um, venue for that. I had a wonderful campaign manager, Carol Brandon, <laughs> and uh, Isla Hartung, who many of you know, designed my uh, publicity material. So it, it was an all-woman, just about all-woman. I had a, a man who was my treasurer. Um, when I looked at the council, another, another thing that sort of um, made me want to do it was that when I looked at the council, seven members, four of them lived within a very small neighborhood near downtown. Nobody from the south side, as far as I know, nobody ever from the south side of town had served on the council, and that's where I lived. So I felt like the people on our side of town needed to have a voice on the council. But I ran, as, of course, as a citywide candidate, as all council members do, and had coffees all over the city. The big issues then were um, the Crosby Willard Bridge. That was one of the big issues. Um, how wide should it be? The mm -hmm. money had already been bonded for it, but there were some people on the council that thought it should be a four lane a bridge. And living on the south side, I didn't see any point in that. I thought this was just a, a bridge to connect neighborhoods, and a three lane bridge was, we needed to have the lane for emergency vehicles, that was a given, that that was adequate, and of course it would have saved some money, and, and that idea did win out. Another big issue, a really heated issue, was the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. Remember that? Mm -hmm. the swimming pool, the money had been bonded, it was sitting there, you could only use it for that. So, but there were still people who said, Janesville doesn't need a swimming pool, we have one in speech, what do we need a swimming pool for? And I heard from, I remember very well, a letter I got from some person who home was in Janesville but they spent the winter in Florida and wrote me this long letter saying why we didn't need a swimming pool. 
in town. But I also remember a letter I got from one of the high school principals arguing for the fact that this would be a really wholesome thing for young people in the community and that um, would be a good idea. I, I tended to agree with that to, to begin with, but it, it generated a lot of discussion. And then the other I issue about the pool was where should it be? And um, Rockport Park was, was not favored by a lot of people because it was so far on the west side, but the city was trying to, to uh, direct growth to the west side and it seemed like that was a logical thing to do was to put the pool in Rockport Park would be the first development in that park. And so that's what happened. Um, let me see. Well, one of the first things that happened when I got on the council after I got elected, and I was endorsed by the Gazette and by the UAW, which I felt very good about, um, was that um, apparently in the past, the city council members had had badges, sort of like the police. And there was a person who had been on the city council, he wasn't off, he was off for a while, and he ran at the same time I did in 79, and he wanted a badge. And so we got this letter from the city manager on each of the council members saying that the badges would be prepared, were being prepared, and they would be ready by a certain time. Well, Simba Wexler was already on the council when I got on, and I called her and I asked her about it, and she says, oh yeah, you know, sort of rolled her eyes, I could see her eyes rolling on the phone. <laughs> and so we decided that what we would do would just, at the very end of the next meeting, not on the agenda, we would each just say to the manager that it wasn't necessary to prepare a badge for us because we really saw no need for it. That's all we needed to do because the Gazette picked up on it immediately. It was in the paper, and long story short, Nobody got badges. Everybody decided they didn't need them after that. But it was just one of the, I think it was sort of like an old boys club thing and, you know, and so. Um, so what else? Oh, another issue, still an issue. Well, there's always sidewalks and golf courses. Those were issues when I was on the council that, that we had to de deal with. Um, council pay, should council members be paid? And I got into a little trouble with the Gazette on that one because I really felt like um, by requiring um, people to give all of their time, you were essentially limiting council service to people who could afford to do that. And that people who were employed, who would have to take time off from a, from a wage earning job, would be discouraged because it would be money out of pocket, wages lost. So I supported the idea of some kind of a per diem or some kind of a little stipend to cover those kinds of expenses. The Janesville City Council still serves with no pay whatsoever, not, no per diem, anything. So that was not a popular idea, but I still support it. <laughs> um, while I was on the, the council, I pushed for more women on the city advisory committees. The police and fire commission had never had a woman on it. And so I pushed for that and we did get a woman. And I ultimately served on that myself after I was no longer on the council, the city manager called and asked me if I would serve on it. I wasn't the first woman on that, but I felt like I couldn't say no after I pushed so hard to <laughs> on that. Um, I think um, probably um, there's better representation now overall than, than in the early days. I never really felt like I was, um, I never experienced any bias when I was a member of the council from the other people on the council, um, everybody was, was very nice and, you know, I, I mean, I, I felt like I was treated as an equal. Uh, one little problem was the chairs were all too big for me. We had to make some adjustment in one of them so I didn't sit with my chin on the desk, but that was a, that was a minor, minor. So uh, to sum up, I, it was a wonderful experience. Uh, I would encourage any of you who've ever thought of doing it to do it. And as I say, if you think you want to have more women in government, then what you need to do is look around you, look for people you think would do a good job, and recruit them, and, and work for them, which is what my friends did for me. And now I hope you're going to be introduced. Thank you. Thank you. Before I forget again, uh, we'll have questions at the end of all the presentations. Our next speaker is Camilla Owen. Camilla played sports in high school right after Title IX was enacted. She was able to use her tennis skills as her ticket to college. For two years in a row, she was awarded the Tennis, tennis Sportswoman of the Year at UW-Whitewater and was inducted into the UW-Whitewater Athletic Hall of Fame in 1999. 
In 2002, she was inducted into the Janesville Sports Hall of Fame. Camilla is a former school district of Janesville tennis coach. Currently, she is an alternative education teacher at Franklin Middle School. She oversees the BOOST program, which aids students at risk for academic failure. No. Thank you. Um, I'm going to tell you that uh, born and raised here in Janesville, so um, this is all I know. <laughs> um, but uh, just to give you a little background, Title IX was first passed in 1972, and it was kind of an educational amendment, and it was supposed to, you know, prohibit discrimination against, um, based on gender. And um, any institution, educational institution that was receiving federal funds, they couldn't discriminate, so that's why um, that was passed. Now, as I look at it, before Title IX, um, looking at academics, uh, I mean, excuse me, looking at sports, um, and I remember this quite well, um, we had the GAA, people might remember, Girls Athletic Association. Oh, yes. Yes. yeah, see, you know. And you know, we had those nice jumpsuit-like things to wear. <laughs> Button down the front. And, um, and then usually the sports, I mean, I know they had basketball and different things, uh, attempts at it. Um, but most of the things that girls could do was, you know, either cheerleading, which is fine, uh, synchronized swim, I remember that was big, uh, square dancing, and then any of that GAA type of activity. Hockey. Yeah, field hockey, field hockey right. Holy. And it was usually about one girl out of 27 that played high school sports at that time. And so it was, it was low, but that was something for them to do. Um, and then since Title IX, um, obviously we have many more opportunities for women in athletics. Uh, we have scholarships, we have many more sports to offer. We have larger budgets because it used to be the budget was 2% of the athletic budget and the rest went to the men. And now it's pretty, you know, equalized as far as in proportion of athletes um, going out for a sport. Um, also, right now we have such elite, you know, you know, you can be an Olympic competitor, you can be a world champion, um, you can play professional now in women, obviously you can do that in basketball, you can play professional tennis and golf, and they've got uh, soccer and things like that, so we've really come a long way, baby, you know. Um, and just to give you an idea, in 2008-2009, um, there were three million, over three million girls participating in high school sports. But in 1971, it was 8%. So we have really, yeah, and that was 41%, but we have just made it drastic, and I think it's open to keep going. Um, my experiences here in Janesville, kind of uh, interesting, is I remember kind of being at the old Marshall Junior High, and uh, and Max Nobinski, if anybody knows her, uh, was my phi ed teacher, and she was letting me know that girls' sports were starting in the high school. And I got so excited because I had started playing tennis. And I thought, this is going to be great. And, um, but you know, at the junior high, they had all these boys' sports, and you know, I wanted to go out and hit with the guys on the tennis team. It was like, well, you can maybe hit with them, but that's about, you know, once in a while. And I thought, well, this just doesn't seem fair. I, I, I don't understand. But we got to the high school. Barb Dietz was my first tennis coach. And uh, she was probably the coach of everything at that time. Um, but we had tennis and basketball, and we had track. And then there was the start of swim. But in 71, I would have been in, in the junior high, when I came up to the high school, it was like the first, you know, getting to do this. And um, it was kind of a, one of those, you know, neat experiences. But now, just so you know, the girls' tennis team, we had our uniform, okay? It was a little top and shorts. And then that was used for the basketball team, and then that was used for the track team. And so before you got back to the tennis team, it was pretty worn out. So my, my second year on the team, I said, let's make dresses. <laughs> so Mrs. Dietz and I made tennis dresses for the team, which was quite hysterical. And I still have pictures of these things. Um, I think I still have them. Um, but it was, it was like to distinguish ourselves, to kind of give us something 
you know, that we could have our own. And um, because you have to remember the school district is now going to have to add to their budget because they're going to have to include girl sports. And also at that time, I kind of dreamed about it would be so neat if I could go to college and play tennis. And unfortunately, um, you know, high school counselors weren't as aware, I would say, of scholarships or things out, out there for women to play. So I just, and I, I was fortunate enough to have a family that would, would help me through school, so I was able to go. And, um, <clears throat> and I, I did start out at the University of Alabama. And um, I did make their tennis team as a walk-on. And then, I, and then I had major knee surgery and, and came back to Janesville and ended up finishing my career at Whitewater. So, um, you know, and I had a wonderful time doing that and seeing women's sports change from when I was in high school, just those few years going to um, college and being able to see that we did get money to travel. We did get a food voucher to eat. They did let us eat. Um, and we did, you know, when we go up to Superior in those places, you know, we were allowed to spend the night, so we, we did get those things. That was kind of like, wow, this is kind of new and different. And we did get uniforms, so we didn't have to wear everybody else's. <laughs> um, but as I came back to Janesville and, um, and tried to, I thought, now, now I will coach. I, I'd love to be in the coaching ranks. And um, did my student teaching at Franklin Middle School. Uh, Dick Iglar gave me a job coaching co-ed tennis, and I thought, this is great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have fun doing this. And so I did that for a few years, and that was probably in 1980, and um, just after graduating. And um, what was interesting is there was a, a job opening at both high schools for uh, boys' tennis, and, and I applied to both, and I didn't get either one. And I thought, what am I doing wrong? And so I knew enough people at Craig to go and talk to Stan Dufresne and Bob Suter and Barb Dietz and say, help me. I mean, I love this game. I know this game. I, I'm very confident about this game. I, I can do this. And they were <clears throat> my best supporters. And what had happened is the principal was pretty leery at the time thinking, you know, we had a man coach the boys team and there were a lot of problems. I'm not sure if I get another, I ever get a woman. And I thought, if you get somebody who knows that sport and those kids respect you for it, that's the person for that job, whether it's man or woman. I, I got the job. So I became the first uh, woman's coach for boys, for boys. And then about four years later, Barb Deed said, I, I'd like you to do the girls. So I, I coached that for about 20 years. And um, I was saying what was interesting is while I was doing that, you know, I'm enjoying that, I noticed that when I got my paycheck for the women's team or the girls' team, it was less than the boys. And I thought, <laughs> I'm doing the same sport, the same length of time. I don't understand this. So now what I did is I presented that to um, people in the Janesville Education Association, our, our union, and saying, I'm doing the exact same thing. This is not fair. And so as a result of a lot of other women coming forward saying, hey, I coach basketball. <laughs> I have the same season you do in boys. So we finally, we got equal. But before that, they wanted to take um, my pay and drop it to the girls' pay I said, no, I want to go up to the boys. <laughs> so we, we, we eventually um, had that happen. But um, I think what they worried about in, in a tennis, um, I don't need a locker room, because the boys usually come down to the courts or whatever. Um, I don't have to you know, do our pep talk in the locker room or any of those things. So I didn't see any issues at that time. So I'm, I'm glad that I was able to overcome that and get it. But I have watched how um, over the years that I have coached um, where we've, we've, we have a girls locker room, there is a team locker room now. There is, you know, we have an equipment, 
We have the same equipment. We have um, uniforms. We get the same uniform cycle. So it, it, it's matched up and it's, it's, um, it's a positive thing. Um, I feel like I'm, you know, was very fortunate to have that opportunity to coach. Um, I just retired um, from that. But just to having to, to see that between the men and women. Um, I, um, I think that uh, the people, you know, Barb Dietz, Carol Luther, um, some of those that you might know, really kind of opened it, the door and, and let us in and, and they really helped us out. And so um, I, I was a lucky, lucky soul to be coaching here in Janesville. Thank you. Our final speaker tonight is Doris Holm. Doris is one of the first women ever hired at the former Gilman Engineering Company. This was during World War II. She spoke up for women's rights at work and then, and after leaving that job, continued to do so after being hired at GM in 1955. Doris has served on a variety of local, state, and national committees regarding women's rights in the workplace and has received honors for, his, for her firsts for women in the workplace. We are honored to have Doris here with us tonight. I am going to talk a little bit about Gilman tonight. I'm going to start out, I usually start with GM, but originally I was just a homemaker, like most women were, after high school. You either went to the dime store to work for a year, or until you got married, or you were a college graduate and you were going in for something else. So I became a wife and a mother, and the war was beginning. Now all these gentlemen from Gilman Engineering, who were engineers, many of them were leaving for the war. What are we going to do? We got things that need doing in the factory. Maybe we can give the women a chance. We don't really know if they're going to do the job. <laughs> you know, after all, these are women that are homemakers, but we'll give them a chance. So I was the second group of eight that came into Gilman Engineering to work. Now we didn't know what we were doing. We had no idea what we were working on. But we were in stanchions, seated so far apart. We were buffing uh, something in a buffer. And um, we were working along, women, kind of talking, a little laughing. Suddenly, our young foreman, and I mean young, <laughs> just out of high school, I think, walked up and said, ladies, there will be no talking, none. be no talking. And he turned around to it's leave. Not it's not, it's not, it's not still not coming. It's not on now? No, maybe what we should do is just use this one. The cord is long enough. I think I can talk loud enough. That's what I yeah, said. The <laughs> <laughs> camera's got to pick it up. Thank you. No. The issue is the camera. All right, here we were all sitting, working away. The young foreman turned around, and all of a sudden the women were tee hee hee hee, and they turned around again, and I said, have you ever seen a group of women that couldn't talk? I said, come on. And he turned around, and that was the end of that. <laughs> I mean, after all, you aren't going to find a group of women that don't talk and that don't laugh together when they're doing a job. All right, so we were working uh, on the emergency landing gear for the Grumman Hellcat, which we hadn't known until years later. Uh, of course, they didn't tell us at the time. Um, I kind of, oh, I don't know how it happened, but I ended up as sort of the head of the factory women. Uh, I worked on large, huge turret lathe, drill press, 
grinding machine, um, just many uh, tools or working uh, units. Um, they showed us how, and we were doing them. Uh, and finally, I said to one of the young men, I said, why couldn't we sharpen our own tools? You don't have to come around and sharpen our tools. Show us how. We can do it. He said, all right. So pretty soon, we were sharpening our own tools. Well, then a couple of weeks later after that, I thought, and I went up to one of them and I said, you know, this is fine, but I think we should receive more money for it. <laughs> the next day we were told women were not to touch another tool unless they were using the thing that they were working on. That was it. Um, I had real good, favorable feelings with Gilman. Very good. Uh, as the, one of the women of the factory, I helped receive the Army and Navy E Award for excellence uh, at Gilman. And I had very, very good relations there. Real, real good years. Um, then I became pregnant with my second, or with my, with my second son. And uh, in those years, if women were working in a job like that, and you were through, you were all done. That was absolutely the way it worked. You did not go back because you were absolutely let go. So in those years, I did a lot of odds and ends. I pelted mink out at McFarland Ranch. I worked at um, uh, inoculating baby chicks. I did a lot of odds and ends of things. And um, plucking turkeys, dirty work, you know. But if you wanted the money, you did the work. So then I heard that GM was hiring. I thought, well, I'm going to try that. So I went down to GM. Now, there must have been about 80-some women working in the cushion room at that time. This was 4 or 5, 55. This was 1955 because I'm now 91 years old, and I was, you know, middle-aged about that time. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, I started in on the cushion line. I worked. I enjoyed it. It was hard work. There was a lot of lifting your arms above your head, that kind of thing. And uh, the work was not easy, but we were doing it. We were all working at it. And suddenly there became an opening for uh, an alternate committee person. Well, nobody else wanted the job. And I thought, well, why don't I try it? They never had another woman, of course, do anything like that. And I thought, you know, it would give me an opportunity to get someplace else on the plant other than in the cushion room. So that's what I did. I became alternate committee woman, not man, I mean, not woman. And so when the fellas left to go to the plant, then I could go out into the plant and take grievances. About the second grievance I had, I won. And men all over the plant said, a woman won that. Can you believe that? Well, okay. So after that, I began to think, why don't I run for office for recording secretary for Local 95? Local 95 is our union. Why couldn't I do that? People kept saying, oh, they wouldn't elect a woman. They've never had a woman elected before for Local 95. So off my shift, I would go, and I would greet the men in the morning and I would hand out my card. I was informed to be sure and have the union label on it. <laughs> and so of course I did. And uh, I would hand it through the windows. And one man went by and he said, you know, I didn't think I would vote for a woman, but if you've got enough gumption to come out in the morning to do this, I'll vote for you. <laughs> so, okay, so I won handily. So I became the first woman to 
have a union position as recording secretary going into the plant or going over union meetings at night. So the first, my first meeting, and I've got to tell you this because it always stuck in my mind so clearly. Usually the men, when they had to go over to the union hall once a week, would receive about a half hour and they would be able to go up to the restroom and wash their hands and so on. And uh, I kept waiting and waiting and nobody came to relieve me. And I thought, well, what's going on here, you know? So about 15 minutes into it, I took off my apron. People around me said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going over to the union hall. Who's going to relieve you? I said, I haven't the faintest idea. <laughs> I walked down the aisle. My foreman was standing there. He said, hey, Tom, where are you going? I said, you know where I'm going. I said, I'm going over to the union hall. He said, well, who's relieving you? I said, well, I certainly don't know. You ought to know. <laughs> you know, he wasn't happy with me. He wasn't a bit happy with me. But the time went by, and I did my job. I was sent by the union, Local 95, to many places where there were women working. And I was seeing places where women were getting out into the factory working right along with the men. And I thought, well, why couldn't I do that? I thought the money would be better. Many of the jobs would be easier. Why couldn't I go out and do that? All I had to answer was to myself, because nobody else could give me that answer. So finally one day I called, I uh, sent a telegram into the Equal Opportunity Commission. It was right about the time when they were coming into, into being. And I sent the state and I sent the federal one a telegram. So I'd have some receipt in my hand that I had done it. About two weeks later, I got a call. A young gentleman stopped at the door and he said, what's this all about, young woman? And I said, well, I said, I would like to move out into the plant, but I'm told that I can't. He said, why not? I said, well, apparently it's past practice. He said, we'll see about that. So he went down to the plant. Oh, in about 15, 20 minutes, he was back, and he said, well, you never even signed up for anything. I said, well, of course not. I wasn't allowed to. They wouldn't take my signature. Well, that's a different story. Soon, I sat with my entire executive board, all men, of course. Um, a lot of them weren't happy with me, let me tell you right now. Um, I sat with two lawyers from Detroit. I sat with my regional director. Uh, some of these people weren't happy. The uh, lawyer from Detroit said, young woman, do you realize what you're doing? And I said, you bet your life I do. <laughs> and he said, well, look at, look at all the things we're going to have to change. We're going to have to change all the flow charts and all these other things. All I said was tough. <laughs> because Nothing could be done at that point. They had to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I was going out into the plant, except that I signed up for every job in line with my seniority, <laughs> and I wasn't getting the job. And I heard through some of my committee men that the fellows were going down the line and they were saying, if you don't want a woman working next to you, you better take that job. So on my next lunch hour, and I had to take my time and go, I saw it went to the plant manager's office. The dear secretary said, and what did you want, dear? And I said, I'll tell them when I get in there. <laughs> I, at that point, I wasn't being very nice. And he said, I said, hello. I'm Doris Tome, and he said, I know who you are. <laughs> Troublemaker, you know. So, and then I explained to him what was happening. And he said, I will, I give you my word. I did not know this was happening, 
But he said, if this is happening, I'm going to meet with all my foremen this afternoon, and I will tell them that there will be no more of that kind of thing happening. I said, I'll take your word for it. But I I'm here to tell you that you, as plant manager, would be in line for an extremely large fine if this keeps happening, because I'm going to report it if it does. He said, okay. So after that, I was signing up. And uh, anyway, my first job was down in a pit. And I was down almost, you could hardly see my head. I was putting weather stripping underneath the cars. And I was working all night long, working above my head with machinery. And I can remember going home at night, almost crying and saying, oh, my arm is so sore. And my dear husband at the time worked over at Chevrolet. And he said, you know you don't have to continue with that. He said, give it up. I said, you know something? I'd die on that line first. <laughs> After I've gone through all of this, I will not give it up. And so it's strange because, you know, I would walk along and there were no, there were no relief uh, toilets in that area, nothing for women. The relief or the uh, restroom was way extreme at the other end. And I was getting comments from my relief men. You're taking too much time, Tom. I said, I can't make it any faster. Finally, I said, I want a committee man. Committee man came over and I said, okay, let's have this out right now once and for all. I said, the next time I have to use the restroom, I'm going to the closest one here. And I said, I'm a married woman. I have two sons, there's nothing I haven't seen. <laughs> the next day I got more relief. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the way it worked. I worked, I walked past the fellows, most of them didn't like me. The very fact that some woman was coming in and taking some of their jobs was just not good. And I guess maybe as I'm older I can understand maybe how they felt. But at that time I didn't feel that way about it. And I would walk past and everybody look away. So one night, it was my birthday. I brought two cakes along, a chocolate cake and a white cake. Uh, usually we were all chow hounds. We'd send things down the line. But I brought paper plates, napkins, and forks, plastic forks. And I set them right beside me. And I sent the word down and I said, it's my birthday, I have some cakes down here. Anybody that would like a piece, come and get it. Before the night was over, the cakes were all gone. They all came and got them. Now this time when you walk past them, they almost had to say, hi. <laughs> <laughs> and it did break the ice. It did. I'll have to admit that that first year was hell. And I use that word advisedly. It really was. But. I stuck to it, I got different jobs, some that were to my own dissatisfaction. I was a large woman, five foot eight and a half, 180 pounds. I took a job where I had to climb in and do the headliners in the cars, which is much, a small person would have worked beautifully in a job like that. So you had to do the job until you could find something different. So eventually, I ended up with some of the best work in final inspection. And my years at GM were very satisfactory. questions now and if anybody wants to stay later and hear more of Doris' stories or from Neil or Nancy, we're very happy to do that. Are there any questions? Yes. Well, I don't have a question, but I certainly have uh, enjoyed what these ladies have told us about. And I knew part of it, but 
to come from your heart and, and uh, your voice inspired. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? I just want to thank you all for being here and I'd like those of you who are in public office to kind of raise your hands. <laughs> or who have been in public office. <laughs> thank you. I want to thank you for, for your service and uh, thank you all for coming tonight.